Well, I, I love Christmas movies. But I, got, I feel like we got a little bit of a late start this year, so believe it or not, I have two weeks, two weeks till Christmas to watch as many Christmas movies as possible that are not on that one channel that plays Christmas movies all day long. One of the, I was thinking of, of these stories that are classic to us, and uh, one of the ones that is, um, you know, one of the most well-loved Christmas stories of all time is entitled A Christmas Carol. You're familiar with it, I'm sure. Charles Dickens wrote the story in 1843, and listen to this, since then it has been adapted 66 times and that's just for the theater. It's been adapted 32 times to different movies. There's been 39 radio programs and audio recordings. There have been 30 television versions. And then there are, listen to all these different avenues, direct-to-video efforts, operas, ballets, graphic novels, comic strips, parodies, video games... I had no idea, and podcasts. And, and to you and to me, I, I don't know if you feel this way, but um, it doesn't really feel like Christmas until Scrooge and Tiny Tim and uh, Bob Cratchit have made their appearances in my life, right? And you know the story. Um, uh, you've heard or seen some version of A Christmas Carol. Ebenezer Scrooge is confronted by these four spirits about the fact that he is just crotchety and miserly. They show him episodes of his life, past, present, and future, and each moment is meant to help this man recognize and see the true meaning of Christmas and for him to turn about his ways and, and redeem the rest of his life. Well, this morning as we open our Bibles, we're going to kind of take the same approach. We are going to look at four episodes from Scripture, and we're going to try and discover a truth about Christmas that's going to help us redeem this season for the glory of God. So if you will turn in your Bibles, uh, we're going to start in the very first pages of Scripture in Genesis. And I want to remind you of uh, this episode. The setting is... Um, this perfect garden, and God is in the garden with us. There's a dewy sweetness to the air. There's no predators or parasites. Everything anyone could ever desire is within reach. And yes, there is work to be done, to be sure. But that work, even the work, has purpose and it has productivity attached to it. And even as we zero in on this single inhabitant of the garden, and before he even realizes that there is one thing that he lacks, that human companionship, God provides it for him. Most significantly, and I think this is uh, where I want us to turn our attention to, this man and this woman have sweet fellowship with God. They talk with him. They are showered with his blessings for their enjoyment. They're given boundaries for their safety, and they have partnership and purpose as God's representatives to his creation. We, we read about this in the book of Genesis, chapter 2. I would encourage you to turn there. I'm going to put some bullet points on the screen, but certainly please feel free to read in your copy of God's Word, starting in verse 15. The Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave, gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and 
And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then God institutes the blessing that is marriage. He gives to the man and the woman a relationship that is meant to reflect uh, his creation such that they are there and they are in the garden and there is innocence and naivety and perfection so that the Bible tells us they're naked and they don't even, they don't even know it. They're not ashamed of that. So that's the setting for this first episode. But as often happens in life, people take for granted the things that they have, the things that they see every day. And in that perfection, in one moment of temptation, that human couple ignore God's perfect design. They go their own way. And in their own wisdom, they violate God's one command. And the sweet fellowship is shattered. Now, instead of blessing and comfort and provision and God's presence, they are afraid and they hide from him because of their sin. And this morning, I really want us through these episodes to trace the reality of God's presence. So look again in the book of Genesis, just probably the next page for you. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. It records for us this part of the story. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This is meant to be a joyous moment, a moment of blessing. But the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The perfection that God had provided and created lasted only the briefest period of time. And now the entire storyline of Scripture shifts from people enjoying God's perfect design to a recovery effort. God is trying for the rest of Scripture to restore, He's working to restore human beings to relationship with God, to that unmitigated presence of God. And this first episode is really foundational for us. If we don't start here, if we don't understand this, if we don't have this as our perspective, we can't possibly understand the rest of the story. If you don't see how everything changed in this moment, you're going to be lost as you try and interpret and understand what's happening in the other stories of, of Scripture, in the other episodes that we'll look at. This first episode sets the stage for the rest of Scripture. This great reclamation project to restore people to the presence of God as it was in the garden. Episode number one. And now as we fast forward in time, there's a key moment in our next episode where God redeems a special people out of bondage. The scene changes. It was a lush, perfect garden, and now we go to a dry and desolate desert. Instead of picturing God's provision, the landscape is barren, and it's lacking life. And there's almost a sense of abandonment. And if you found yourself in this place, if I found myself in this place, we might wonder how we were going to survive. It's a total contrast to the garden where God's presence is near and it's vital. The desert represents an exile from God's presence. But we know because the psalmist tells us that there is nowhere that we can flee from God's presence. And in fact, instead of the desert being a deserted place, God's people are about to experience God's power. We come across Moses who meets God in the desert. This is what Exodus chapter 3 says. Turn a forward one book in your Bible and Exodus chapter 3 tells us an angel, the angel of the Lord, appeared to him, that's Moses, in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, 
I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And you and I think to ourselves, and perhaps Moses thought to himself, maybe God has not abandoned his people after all. Maybe he's not removed his presence completely from them. And we come to find out just in the next verses, just a couple of verses down, that God indeed has not abandoned his people. In fact, he's been waiting for them. He's been watching them. He's been waiting for just the right time to rescue them. And so God says to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse, starting in verse 6, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Does that sound familiar? Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Notice God comes down to them. He gives them himself. And God, we know, because we know the story, fulfills that promise. He overwhelms Egypt. Egypt, the political and military superpower of the day. God overwhelms the, them with his divine power. If you just go down just further in that chapter, but I know the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. Good thing, because God says, I've got a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And so we see God's power again on display for all to see. But it's not just that, because even in these first passages we looked at it as Exodus, his presence is there as well. And again, Moses leads the people out of bondage in the land of Egypt. We read it this way. It says this, The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, listen, did not depart from before the people. God is there with them. God's power and his presence are evident. And once again, if we turn forward to uh, the book of Exodus chapter 19, we are now at Mount Sinai, still in the desert, and the people wait in the desert at the foot of the mountain. And we read this. The Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set limits for the people all around saying, take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the edge of the mountain shall be put to death. And then if we skip forward to verse 16, it says this, on the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then... Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln. And the whole mountain trembled greatly. And, the sound, and as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. The people knew that God was with them. God was for them. But as they experience God's presence and God's power, they also become increasingly aware of God's holiness. And they were aware that God was holy and they were sinful. And they continued to be separated from him to a degree, even though God was God was displaying his presence. There was still this gap. There was still this gulf. 
and facing God's awesome power and their inability to come near to him, they might have questioned, do we just go from bondage in Egypt to be deserted and separated in the desert? In fact, this is the very question. This is the exact complaint that they'll have several times along the way. We, we should have stayed back in Egypt. So what's the solution? Well, if we were to flip the pages of our Bible from Exodus chapter 25 to Exodus chapter 40, it is filled with some very, very detailed plans for the tabernacle. This was this unique tent that was meant to be the meeting place between God and man. It was God's plan for that moment in time to remind the people that his presence was in their midst. And as we read these chapters of our Bible, or perhaps better yet, we skim over these chapters in our Bible because they're really hard to keep up with in our reading plan, everything in the tabernacle points to God's presence. The size and the design of the tent the materials of the curtains and the poles, the furniture inside and outside of, of the tabernacle and how it's arranged, the processes for building and moving and maintaining the tent, even those who were qualified to work in the tabernacle, everything points to God and His presence. And so, as the story goes, the people go about collecting those materials. They go about putting together the tent. And at the end of the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 40, and if you're following along in your Bible, I would say, turn there at this moment. The tabernacle is finished. God and man can finally be reunited. Or as we read in the end of the book, can they be? Because here's what we read. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Wait a minute, wasn't this the whole point? Wasn't this the whole purpose to build this thing? To meet with God, to be in his presence. And once again, the people must have wondered if God had led them here only to abandon them. Fortunately, that's not where the story ends. And if we turn over to the very next book of the Bible, the very first sentence, the very first verse of that book, Leviticus, the Bible answers the question. It says this, The Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. That's the very next part of the story. Now, because of man's sin in the garden, separation between God and man still exists in this moment. But God had graciously provided a plan to temporarily bridge that gap so that people could come near to him. And it involved sacrifices and uh, uh, cleansing rites and ceremonies and all of those things that are contained in the book of Leviticus. Up to this point in the story, the plot seems a little bit like one of those uh, uh, episodes that you might see where the main characters just can't seem to get on the same page. The two key characters keep missing one another. Circumstances conspire to keep them apart, often through a comedy of errors. Even this temporary solution that God put in place in the desert seems to be failing as we move ahead in the story. The, the temporary tabernacle becomes a permanent temple and the people seem less and less interested in meeting with God in that place, at least according to his instructions. And they once again take his presence for granted, just as the man and the one, woman in the garden had done. And in this moment, where God's people are routinely ignoring God's word, we get another episode. And so fast forward into the 8th century BC, we're going to meet with Isaiah the prophet. And it was Isaiah who ministered to Israel as they had wandered far from God. And God had led them out of the desert. He had given the people a home and a land that was bountiful. He rescued them from their enemies, but they had rejected his leadership. They had said, no, 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 we want human kings instead of God as our king. 
And God had warned them about this. He had said, just like he had said to the man and the woman, if they were following his lead, that was the only success to path, and, path to success and blessing. He warned the people against rejecting his royal leadership. And sure enough, the king said that the people had chosen split the nation in two. Most of them did not follow the Lord. And not only that, but they were at this moment under threat from foreign nations who were moving in to take them captive as they had been in Egypt. And so God sends his man, Isaiah, to urge the people to return to the Lord. And his message is one of deliverance. In fact, we read it this way in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, and these will be very familiar Christmas words to us where Isaiah delivers God's message, the promise of peace. He says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from, from this time forth and forevermore. What an incredible promise to these people. Under threat from foreign invasion. Instable because they had not followed God's ways and God's commands. This promise of stability. This promise of national sovereignty. And it was going to serve as a great promise for many years to come because it wasn't immediately realized as we know. And sure enough, they were invaded by foreign powers. They were occupied. They were exiled. And yet this whole time they had in their mind that God will bring us peace and he will do so through, what, a child? That doesn't seem right. How could that possibly be the case? And you and I know the story. We're here to celebrate it this morning, especially in this season. Isaiah's words become very familiar to us. This child, as we celebrate during the season of Advent, was not just any child. This child carried the promise of God's restored presence because it was not just an ordinary deliverer. As much as they revered Moses, as much as they, he was a significant figure in their nation's history, they needed something more. And that is what God promised Isaiah's message was that God himself was coming to be with his people just like he had been in the garden. And we read about it in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. He says this, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And we later come to discover that Emmanuel means God with us. After Isaiah's time for hundreds of years, remember he ministered in the 700s BC, prophetic voices would echo that same promise, that same hope from God. And the question on every Israelite's mind was, when will God's promise come true? When will this promised one come and actually do what God is promising to deliver us from our enemies? And so we fast forward to the final episode. The Gospel of John does not open with a cuddly birth story like Matthew and Luke. But it takes us on a similar journey to the one we've traveled this morning. All throughout history... You may remember that the gospel starts with these words in John chapter 1, verse 1. It says this, In the beginning was the Word. John speaks of God before history. But there with God, before the beginning of time, 
is someone else, something else. He is with the Word, and yet John explains the Word is not separate from God. The Word is God. The Word, in fact, was in the garden. The Word was the powerful force of creation. And in John's words and through John's words, we come to discover that the Word is coming again into the world. In fact, the Word is the one about whom the Gospel is about. The Word is the Son, Jesus Christ. And as we read, we recognize these familiar echoes of the story so far. And so John writes, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John speaks about Jesus, God's Son. Jesus is the Word. Jesus and the Father are one. And we know that because the Son possesses some of the same identifying qualities as the Father. He is full of grace and He is full of truth. He shows us His glory, even though it's veiled in humanity. And the Son son comes to earth with the same purpose as the Father. When, When John writes that Jesus dwelt among us, he uses this word from Scripture that has previously been used for the tabernacle in the desert. And so he says, the word dwelt among us, he tabernacled with us, It was God's provision for his people to once again meet with him just as they had in the desert when they wondered if God had deserted them. He provided this tent, this tabernacle where God and man could meet. Remember though, that was temporary and now in Jesus, God provides this permanent way, the human tabernacle to meet with God in the flesh. In Jesus' birth, what we celebrate in this day, in this season, we come to the most dramatic moment up to that point in history. Everything has been building to this moment. God's plan for humanity, that reclamation project that started in the garden, centers on Jesus. But not just the baby in the manger, Jesus as the tabernacle where men meet with God. The sacrifices that had been offered in the desert, in the tabernacle, by the priests, are now offered by the high priest, Jesus, in his death and resurrection. Jesus' blood shed on the cross allows men to cross the barrier created by Adam's sin in the garden. It solves the problem of separation between God and man. In Jesus, people have People have to be, people never have to be separated from God's presence again. In Jesus, the relationship between God and man can be restored. In Jesus, people can once again experience the presence of God. And for us this morning, as we contemplate these things, maybe, maybe you love Christmas because of all the warm fuzzies and all the tradition and all the nostalgia surrounding it. Maybe, it, maybe you come to church, particularly in this season, to experience some of the traditions of the holidays, the carols and the, the decorations and all those things. You sing songs about Jesus because it helps you feel connected to your spiritual roots. And then the rest of the year, when the tech calendar turns to January, there's this incredible feeling of emptiness and loneliness. The truth of Christmas is something more than a generically spiritual experience. It's not just for warm fuzzies. It's about Jesus' ultimate purpose to reconnect us to God through faith in his life, death, and resurrection. Instead of being warm fuzzies, for a lot of people, uh, Christmas is a time that is is just terrible and awful. They're aware that it, you know, other people are going around singing that song that, and it kind of slaps them in the face that this is the most wonderful time of the year and they think to themselves, "Ah, 
Everyone else seems to be joyous. I'm not feeling that. I, I am acutely aware of all the things that I have lost. Maybe you are feeling abandoned in the desert of difficult circumstances. Broken relationships, broken aspirations, things that you've lost along the way. And the truth for you this morning is this, that God in Jesus, the tabernacle, wants to meet you in those difficulties and show you his power and his presence. And the question is, are you willing to meet with him through his son? In Christmas, sometimes we try and recreate the wonder of Jesus' birth, and we imagine, close our eyes, and we imagine that angelic choir breaking the silent night there in Bethlehem. But it doesn't always work. And part of the time is because we are living in a, a, a moment of time that is rather low in terms of its dramatic nature. We are in between these high point episodes of history. And I would say we are in a time much like those people who had heard of Isaiah's prophecy for hundreds of years. And they're imagining that it will come in the future. They're hoping that it will come in the future. But they're living in a time of promise and waiting. Jesus promises us that in that waiting, even to his disciples as he's leaving earth, he promises them, I'm coming back. I will return. He promised those first disciples that in that in-between time, the Holy Spirit would come, and the Holy Spirit would comfort and counsel his people. They would still have the presence of God in their midst. But meanwhile, you and I and they wait for Jesus to return, and he will return. Emmanuel, God with us, will once again bring us into God's presence and the Bible tells us that his glory will light the sky and he will be in the midst of his people. And Jesus, God's tabernacle, will be in our midst for all eternity. That is our hope. That is what we expect. That is what we wait for. And that is how we identify with those people who were long ago waiting for the same thing, for God to come, for Jesus to come. Now, I should offer a spoiler alert because I'm about to tell you the end of Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. Scrooge wakes up Christmas morning and he's changed. He is transformed having seen the truth given to him by the visiting spirits. And that's the happy ending to the story. And, and we come to church on a weekly basis and we hear God's story every week given to us by the Holy Spirit. You and I have been visited by God's presence, not just by Jesus who came as a baby and lived his life as a human and died on the cross and rose again, but we have been visited by God's presence in his Holy Spirit if you are a believer. And the question for us this morning is, is that something more than a story? Do you wake up changed and transformed. That's not something that you can do on your own, by the way. It's not something that uh, you can't just deposit a few coins at an appropriate time in the Christmas season when the bells ring like Scrooge does. You can't make up for it in a single act. You can't go out and buy a Christmas goose and everything will live happy, happily ever after. The only hope for us is to come to God's tabernacle, and I'm not talking about the church talking about Jesus. Jesus, God's Son, who brings us the presence of God and invites us to meet with Him. Let's pray. Father, we come to You this morning. We come as Your people, adopted into a new family, recognizing that our only hope in life and death is You, through Your Son. We come to you desiring something that maybe we can't even articulate, but the thing that we desire is to be with you, our creator and our redeemer. We come to you recognizing that on our own, we are totally incapable of,
of coming to you. But we are thankful that your son Jesus Christ came and died on the cross and rose again. We are thankful that he took on himself the penalty of our sins so that we could stand before you if we placed our faith in you, knowing that we have new life through the resurrection of Jesus. We are not guilty of our sin, but instead we wear the righteousness of Christ. Father, that's awful, an awful lot for a little baby to bear, but that is the story of Christmas. And God, now it is, it is our great privilege to come and not only celebrate that with the tradition and nostalgia of the season, but to, to go and represent that to a world that lives outside these walls and acknowledges that story only as a seasonal truth. Father, would you allow us to do that in a way that is powerful? Would you allow us to live on mission and be on mission for you? Not just today, not just in December, but for the entire year with the joy that is so noteworthy this season. God, may that joy and may that peace be ours year-round because of your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.